Father God, thank you for your presence with us this morning. Father, as we've remembered, thank you that we've been able to think back on this Remembrance Sunday and give thanks. Thank you for those in that context testimonies that the church is present even in the most difficult of places. So far as we come now to look at your word, we ask that you're going to continue to be with us. We ask that you're going to speak to us, ask that you're going to help us in our understanding. But most of all, in this context, we're going to hear your voice speaking to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're continuing uh, the series that I've been doing with you looking at uh, a part of the Old Testament that most Christians have never looked at. It's one of the strangest books in the Bible, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you'd like to turn to it, if you don't know where it is, the index is awfully handy. If you do have one of our church Bibles with a purple cover, you'll find the passage we're looking at today beginning on page six hundred and. 75. I really like the book of Ecclesiastes. I enjoy it because it asks all sorts of difficult questions, questions about life that people prefer not to look at. People like to think and pretend that life isn't how life is. Ecclesiastes makes you look at it, challenges you to look at it with all its unpleasant bits as well. And it asks a lot of questions, questions that undermine confidence in human wisdom, undermine confidence in human pleasure, confidence in human justice. All of that is undermined in this book. Its themes include, and very relevant to today on this Remembrance Sunday, includes looking at how frail and fragile life is and how important it is, therefore, to seize the day, to take the moment that presents itself. I was thinking of that this morning with that story that we had earlier on of that 19-year-old soldier who wanted to go over the top at the end of the day to go and find his friend, who had gone over earlier and hadn't come back, and how he seized that moment and he found that friend and was able to comfort him as he died, seizing the moment. It's also very relevant because it challenges many of the assumptions, many of the values in the cultures in which we live. And we're going to see some of that as we go through today. I'm not going to talk about the background to the book. It's on our website in the first section in this series. Uh, You'll find me there explaining the background of the book, so I won't repeat that today. Today we're starting at chapter 9 and verse 13, and we're going to be working through to the uh, chapter 10 and verse 18, I think, something like that. No, chapter 10, verse 20. We'll go right to the end of chapter 10. Let's make it a bonus. Is that all right? Now, when I'm teaching, just to remind you, and for those of you here for the first time, um, I do actually ask questions. Now, most preachers, when they ask questions, they ask you a question and they tell you the answer. Now, when I ask questions, I stop and pause and you tell me the answer. So you're not here just to listen. You're here to work with me. Is that okay? Is that okay? Don't sound very convinced. Is that okay? As I say always, we're going to do it anyway. So let's begin at uh, chapter 9. I'll get a little bit of context about chapter 10 when we get there, but we'll come in at uh, chapter 9 and verse 13. I also saw under the sun. Now, just to pause for a moment, that phrase under the sun in Ecclesiastes has a particular meaning. It's not about how warm it is or whether it's cloudy. 
it's a phrase that signifies we're looking at life imagining that God's not there, imagining that God doesn't exist. So under the sun is looking at life in human terms. Okay, so I saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge seed works against it. But there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised. His words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Those first few verses, verses 13 to 15, uh, illustrate something that was true then. It's just as true today. Public gratitude doesn't last very long. Which is what Remembrance Day is about. If we didn't have Remembrance Day, we wouldn't be remembering those who had laid down their lives in so many different contexts. Public gratitude does not last long. Verses 16 to 18 are actually really quite important. I want to spend a bit of time with those. The writer's commenting that the opinions that are shouted the loudest or those that are backed by force are often the ones that are listened to rather than things which are wise or things that are true. You know, it was true back thousands of years ago, but... I think it is very true in our society today. Just think about some of the debates that that go on. Uh, I'm not going to name any particular. You just think of some that that come to your mind. Some of the big debates going on in our society about policy, economic policy, moral issues. Or maybe you might think about disagreements within your work context, or maybe your family. The tendency is for opinions that are shouted the loudest to be the ones that are listened to. Is that true? But it's also true that just because it's loud, it doesn't mean that it's wise. You know, and we as Christians, we, we, I want you to plug into this because we get affected by the values that are around us. You know, we, all of us here are a part of society. We, we, we reflect different cultures and we're engaged in different ways, but we're, we, we are affected by those things that are around us, just the life that we live in. And so there is that tendency for us just to assume that this is what's normal, And without doubt in our society, it's he that shouts the loudest, unless the person is clearly an idiot, he that shouts the loudest is the voice that tends to get heard. And, and so, which means that we think that perhaps that is the wisest position. I was listening, I was driving back last night, it was my youngest son's Uh, birthday on Friday and we had a meal together the whole family last night I was driving back last night listening to a program on Radio 4 which um, probably most of you never listened to it's something called the Moral Maze anybody else ever listen to that okay so last night they were debating taxation is taxation morally good now it was a fascinating discussion 
And uh, the very first speaker rather undermined their position by shouting and actually accusing one of the panel of being a Nazi. Yeah, this is an economic discussion about um, taxation, moral or not. And you can see they'd sort of lost the plot a bit. But there is that tendency, isn't there, around, you know, if you think you can throw your verbal weight around, that somehow you can carry the day. But it was interesting that when the, at the end of the, uh, the, the way the program works is that you've got this issue laid out and then you have expert witnesses that are brought in who are interviewed and then the panel discuss the evidence at the end of the day that's been brought by each of the, each of the people. And, uh, and this person was uh, generally just dismissed by the panel because of the way they just basically behaved. Because they saw that wisdom doesn't lie in loud words. So when we're engaged in thinking about issues, we need to take this on board in family, at work. We need to take a step back and we need to be thinking, what is wise here? It's not necessarily the view that most people hold. It's not necessarily that which is loudest. We come into chapter 10 and, and chapter 10, you, you think Ecclesiastes as a book is weird. Chapter 10, well, you're going to find it even weirder. Because what chapter 10 is, it's an interlude. It's an interlude all the way through the book so far. We've been looking at some really tough questions. Uh, we've been thinking about our own death, for example. I think I've had you a couple of times turn to the person next to you and encourage them by saying, I'm going to die. And so are you. It still gets nervous laughter, isn't that interesting? But enough of that. We've been looking at some of those, uh, some of those issues and uh, wrestling with those questions. And, and chapter 10 forms an interlude between the end of that and the conclusion of the book, which we're going to look at later this month when we try and draw together the things that we've been looking at as we've looked at Ecclesiastes. So it's, it's an interlude and it's full of a series of observations about life and about foolishness and wisdom. It's full of metaphors and pictures. We're going to try and unpack some of those because some of them don't work very well in our culture. It's not immediately obvious, for example, why making a hole in a wall might mean you get bitten by a snake. I doubt that's something, Frank, when you're doing do-it-yourself, You've been making holes in walls here in the church building. Were you worried about getting bitten by snakes? No. So, what, so we need to do a little bit of work to understand some of these images here because they're from a different culture. But there's a lot of observations here, and, and it's a series of different things. The overall theme is the difference between foolish behavior and words and wise behavior and words. But uh, it's a little bit disconnected as we go through. It's, it's wisdom literature. So it's a series of sayings. It's a little bit like reading extended proverbs. And some of them are really, well, I think they're all fascinating. Some of them are very fascinating. So you okay with me doing that? As I said, we're going to do it anyway. Chapter 10. Listen to this. As dead flies... Give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honour. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, I'll explain that in a moment, the heart of the fool to the left. Even as he walks along the road, the fool lacks sense and shows everyone how stupid he is. Right, before we get into that, we need to understand the word fool here. This is not about someone's IQ. It's not about, did you leave school without any qualifications? It's not, it's not about intellectual ability at all. So park that idea over there. In wisdom literature, fool is not about intellectual prowess or the lack of it. It's about character and belief in God. So someone who is a fool has got, in wisdom literature terms, two things wrong with them. 
They've got a character fault of some sort or another. And we're going to explore some of those as we go through this chapter. And or they don't believe in God. Because frankly, in the view of the wisdom literature, anybody who doesn't believe in God, well, they're foolish. Because God made it all, God's in charge of it all, so if you bracket God out, you're foolish. With me? So when he's talking about the fool here, all the way through this chapter, and elsewhere in the wisdom literature, that is what the term fool means. Now, earlier in Ecclesiastes, the, the writer has been talking quite a bit about fools, and uh, he's talked about them as being noisy, shallow, lazy, unreceptive to advice, morally blind. All of those are things that he says earlier. Here he adds in verse 3 that the fool is so full of their own views that they cannot resist sharing them with everybody else. You know, elsewhere it talks about the wise person keeps their counsel. Well, the fool is the opposite. They're so full of stuff that they can't... So even when they walk along the road, the fool shows everyone how stupid he is. Because they can't stop expressing their own views. Now, just a couple other things to help you understand this. The heart of the wise. Now, remember that in the Old Testament, in, in the New Testament, the, where the... The, the heart and um, the head and all the rest of it, they relate more to the way that we use those terms today. But in the Old Testament, they are different. So in modern, New Testament modern thinking, the heart is where the emotions sit. Yeah? In Old Testament, that's not where the emotions were thought to sit. Do you want to know where the emotions sat? Would you like to know? It's in the bowels. Just thought you'd like to know that. What sat in the heart was the will. So it's all moved down a level, you know. So the emotions have gone down here. And, the, and the, so the heart is about the will. It's not about emotion. Because emotion is what's felt a bit further down. I can see that some of you didn't like me using the word bowel, so I won't use it again. <laughs> okay, so we're talking here. The, so, the, so the heart of the wise, so this is the will of the wise, inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Now, what on earth is that about? Well, in Hebrew wisdom literature, the left and the right have very specific meanings. And you see that also reflected in, in the New Testament. Where's the important place to sit in terms of, if, with a ruler? You sit on the... You don't sit on the left, do you? Why don't you sit on the left? Because the left is the place of incompetence. The left is the place of wrong-headedness. It stands for that. The right is always associated with goodness and strength. This is not a party political broadcast on behalf of any particular... <laughs> Political view, this is Old Testament wisdom literature. Okay, so let's not get into, into that. So what he's saying here is the fool, in his will, in his thinking, he inclines to wrong-headedness. He inclines to incompetence. Now, of course, this is all a caricature, which is what verse 1 is about. You see, no one is actually completely foolish. And no one is actually completely wise. Even if it's in their surname. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in. And that's what verse 1 is about. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honour. The idea here is that a wise person's life has, if you like, a, to use the picture, a fragrant smell around it. 
It's attractive, like a nice perfume. But it only takes a little bit of folly, a small mistake, to drown out that pleasant aroma. It just takes one teeny fly in the ointment. Get that in our modern? It's one of several proverbs that have been drawn from this chapter, actually. We'll come to some others later on. But one little fly in the ointment, one little fly in the perfume to turn it from being sweet-smelling to being yuck. And how true is that? One of the things that's fascinating, if you've got a mind that's like that, with um, a lot of modern politics is this whole thing about journalists, apologies to the journalists present in the room, but the obsession with journalists looking at someone's good life, trying to find something bad to say about them. It's an obsession that's there. I read a funny story last night. Uh, I won't use the person's name here just to make sure I don't get sued. But um, it was uh, looking at a particular person standing for Congress in the States. And there's a particular journalist in the States who specialises in looking at people's war records and digging out the fact that what they're saying publicly wasn't true. You know, like they never went to Vietnam, they, they never killed 2,000 people, and you know, all of that sort of stuff. And they were investigating a particular guy who had said he had served, but really hadn't said anything about him at all. And discovered he'd actually been awarded medals for bravery. He just never mentioned it. Now, how rare is that? Normally, it's the other way around, isn't it? They're just trying to find a little bit of dirt to get rid of this. So, you know, in our own lives, lessons here. As we try to live wise lives, we need to be careful because even a small dead fly, a little bit of foolishness. It takes far less to ruin something than to create it. So I want you to think for a moment. Let's, let's just pause. Let's think back over these verses from verse 13 of the last chapter through until where we've got to verse 3 of chapter 10 and just think about our own context and society I've given you some examples already I've got a bit carried away because I quite like this image as you can tell uh, any thoughts about our own here's the question so this is the preacher's question that I'm going to listen to the answer to how does this do you think do you take it how does this apply in our own context and situation what are some of the things in our lives, in our family context, our social context, our work context? How do you think some of these things actually, what can we learn from what's taught in these verses, apply to our lives in the things that we're doing? What do you think? Sorry, I, I can see that I've come to you with a microphone. If you just put your hand up, I should have said that, sorry. It's better to listen than to be heard sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, God has given us two years, so sh we should listen twice as much than when we speak because we've got only one mouth. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, God's given us two ears but one mouth. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Don't look so worried. Um, I think that it's not that I'm worried, Andy. It's, it's just I was just looking around the room here and thinking about you. I mean, you're someone who tweets a great deal and and uh, does all of that a lot. And I'm just wondering how some of this stuff resonated with with that. And that's what I thought you might be going to comment on. And I was going to give you a line to introduce that, but um, I didn't. But I have now. Uh, no, I'm going to take the fifth on that particular line of inquiry um, at this stage. Um, but no, the, the, the whole thing in, in the first part, um, I, mean, I suppose the modern phrase would be, uh, which is counter to, to this, is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, and there's a, you know, the idea is you have to get your point across in, in anything, you know, if you're in career progression and so on and so forth, you shout the loudest, then you'll get the rewards. Um, but this is clearly counter to that. And yet, 
tweeting is difficult because um, it only takes five seconds to put it out there, but it's you know very difficult to bring it back. <laughs> we won't dig any further into that at the moment. Okay. I'm pleased to see that a journalist wants to uh, enter into this discussion. Well, yeah, I, I, I was just going to enter the discussion from, from the point of view of the social media issue. I mean, so social media has made news so much more instant now, um, particularly depending on who is tweeting or on Facebook or, or whatever it might be. I mean, apparently if Peter Andre tweets, everybody has to read exactly what he ate for breakfast and all that kind of stuff. Why that's fascinating, I'm not sure. For, for me, for, well, for me, the, for me, the difficulty as a journalist is that social, social media might be instant, but it doesn't, it doesn't particularly say an awful lot. You, you can, we seem to be fascinated by the idea that somebody has tweeted something. The question is, for me as a journalist, is why did they tweet it? What, was there some value to why they tweeted it? Are you, are, are you going to ask the question behind that? Or are you going to be lazy and just say, so-and-so said this? And the trouble is, journalism is moving towards a direction that says, I'm just going to report that so-and-so said that. That's very interesting, because later on in this passage, we're going to look at um, uh, the whole point of just standing back and taking time before we respond. I, I saw that hand over here. Um, just in the case of the way you said, it takes a lot of time to build something good, but it takes something very small to destroy it. So, like, to build relationships and friendships with people, it takes a lot of time and effort. But you can say something quickly, something small, and all of that can be destroyed very quickly. Thank you. I'll make this the, uh, the last one. I'm not quite sure I'm going to get to you. Let me try. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking about perhaps bringing it a bit more to personal in that, it's really about our character. It's like, if we practice and develop the fruits of the spirit rather than shouting out how good we are and using our words, our character will speak louder than any word that's said. But even so, when we make a mistake, it will kind of impact. So it's, it's instead, you know, we could just one word could destroy a relationship that's taking a long time to build, but at the same point, it's still worth investing in the character because otherwise we're going to look foolish. Great, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to the uh, next bit of this chapter, this next set of sayings. And these are examples of um, foolish behavior. So here's the first, verse 4. If a ruler's anger rise against you, do not leave your post. Calmless can lay great errors to rest. Let me read that with a different word. If a manager's anger rises against you, if your boss's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great errors to rest. This is an observation about the strange human behavior known as the huff. Which refers, in this context, to somebody resigning because the person in charge of them has been out of sorts with them. It's um, self-inflicted damage. It usually has got a lot more to do with the person's own pride than any point of principle that they'd like to talk about, often loudly. So that's the first bit of foolish behaviour. If a manager boss's anger rise against you, don't leave your post. Calmness can lay great errors to rest. And you'll notice in this stuff as we go through the rest of this chapter, there is this theme about taking time to stand back and to be calm and to reflect. Uh, the next few, verses 5 to 7. There's an evil I've seen under the sun, the sort of error that arises from a ruler. Fools are put in many high positions, remember what the word fool means, while the rich occupy the low ones. I've seen slaves on horseback, while princes go on foot like slaves. These are all pictures around the fact that sometimes people with 
resources lack opportunities and people with opportunities lack resources. Come back to that in a moment. Here's a series of, of metaphors. A, a metaphor is a, a picture um, that illustrates a truth. There are limits. You mustn't push metaphors too far. But, uh, so these are, these are a series of, of metaphors. Uh, so I'll read them through and then we'll go back through them and, and, and have a look at what they're about. And the snake's coming now, Frank, so just to help you with the walls for the future. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be mitten, bitten, mitten, may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. If a snake bites before it's charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. Okay, consequences of foolish behaviour. So let's, some of them are, are more obvious than others. Digging a pit and then falling into it is about self-entrapment. It's what sometimes people do in a work context. You know, they, they try and set somebody up for a fall because they want their position or they want to get, you know, climb up the, the ladder. And to use a different expression that they didn't have in those days, it backfires. There's a classic, I mean the classic Old Testament one is in the book of Esther. When this guy builds this huge gallows because he's out to get somebody. And guess who ends up on the gallows? The guy who built it, hung on his own gallows. So, you need to be careful about digging pits for other people to fall in. Breaking through a wall, getting bitten by a snake. Well, in those days, uh, most of the houses were made of mud, uh, which was put over a, a frame. And uh, I've, a couple of years ago, was visiting a, a one of the areas in our world, it's one of the biggest areas actually in the Americas, of, of extreme poverty. And uh, for the first time, I actually went inside houses like this that are built in this way. So it's just um, a piece of wood that have been, uh, when I say piece of wood, I don't mean planks, I mean lumps of tree stuck in the ground and then mud put over them. And uh, one of the features of walls like that is they have big cracks in. Now in this particular area that I was visiting, they had a huge problem with poisonous spiders hiding in the cracks and then biting people. And they found a way to deal with that, but that's another story. This context here, you've got these big cracks, so, and it's you know, pleasantly warm as well, you know, in the, in the wall, in the sunshine, so snakes have a habit of just curling up and having a nice rest inside the wall. Now, breaking through the wall is about breaking into someone else's property. That's the image here. So someone comes along and tries to push their way through the wall. I mean, they're not very secure mud walls with bits of tree. But here's the danger. If you stick your hand through and you come across a sleeping snake, that snake might well bite you. Come back to what that's about in a moment. The next one in, in verse 9, the stones and the logs. It's about taking appropriate care to minimize risk. The one in verse 10 is about the folly of doing things in haste 
without proper preparation, instead of using wisdom to consider the situation and take appropriate action. It's not actually about chopping, chopping down trees. It's a metaphor. Okay, so it's about an axe. You know, you've got a tree you want to cut down, you've got an axe, and so the foolish person will go and just start hacking at the tree. The wise person will ask, is the axe sharp? It's not sharp. I'll go and sharpen the axe. So this is about considering the situation, taking appropriate action. So here's the question. Now, you don't have snakes in many walls, at least not in Greenford. Have you found any snakes in the walls in Greenford, uh, Frank? No, no snakes. Okay. And we don't often use axes to chop down trees that often here. But taking these metaphors and thinking about our own context, our own example, what can we learn in today's terms from these examples of foolish behavior that can help us to live lives that are guided by wisdom today? What do you think? If you don't keep your brakes in good order, you're going to crash. Yeah, that's a good... Uh, add that in as a good proverb. How do you think that... And I'm going to push you on this. I can do that because I know you can answer this. So what does that look like? I mean, you're, you're using that not about your car, but what does that look like in terms of someone's life? Well, in terms of some, you have to take care of, first of all, daily things that really need uh, attending to. You have to not only attend to physical things, but you have to attend to, to your spiritual life. Uh, you have to attend to your relationships. Otherwise, things are just going to fall apart eventually. Uh, there's going to, uh, you know, that, why do we have so many divorces? Well, one of them, basically the main reason that we have so many divorces is we decide we fall out of love with a person and then we're just not interested anymore and we're not uh, continuing to feed the relationship, which is what you need to do all along. So that's the kind of thing. Great, thank you. I've got a sort of minor example of that. Um, I get lots of emails for petitions, you know, from 38 Degrees, Change.org, whatever. And I've sometimes signed a petition um, recently, there was one about the recall vote that uh, was being looked at. And it sent a, a message to our local MP saying, uh, we're concerned that you voted against it. And he replied and said, well, actually, I didn't vote against it. The truth is that it was some of the things that were being debated. I didn't agree with the amendments. And when he gave me a full and frank uh, account of what had happened and what was happening... I've realised that I had blindly signed something and these people have got their, their facts wrong. So put the brakes on and think before you do something. Very good. We had a great debate about email at school and, and one of the, not quite a rule, but an unwritten thing was never fire back an email when you're angry. Always wait until you've settled down, think about it before sending a reply. Very good advice. One of the things that the pastors here do is when they've written a difficult email, they leave it in the draft, often for 24 hours, before they send it. Because then you look at it and you've had a chance to pray about it and to mull it over rather than that instant response. So... That's part of our policy here for those uh, things. So if you, it takes a while to get replies to an email. You might, now you know why. What else? Ah, sorry. Um, I still haven't quite mastered this new layout of the chairs yet and worked out the best way of getting to people. I'm, I'm going to have to start having some roots painted on the carpet, I think. What I'm going to say is going to sound a bit funny, but I, I thought I got to say it. I remember when I was job searching, I had the, the address of an employer at the top of the page. But the job I was applying for was for another employer. And before checking everything, I clicked on send. And then I realized, oh my God, 
I've sent the job application to the wrong employer. And then I said that to the person who was sitting next to me because we were in a sort of a training place. And she said to me, I wonder if you're gonna get this job. And I thought, no, 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 because they, first of all, it will already give the wrong impression to, to the employer. So really, we need to stop and think or before we act, or if we write in a letter or whatever, we got to check everything through before we click on send or before we put it in, in the envelope and then put it through the letterbox and then say, whoa, I've sent this to the wrong, but it's already in the letterbox. Mm -hmm. And we cannot get in there and take it out. And sometimes even if we wait hours for the postman, it's not gonna happen. So sometimes in life, we just gotta check things through before we um, conclude and send <laughs> or whatever, just being careful. And also I need to say quickly, when we learn health and safety, we need to put this into action because it's not just learning this and saying, oh, I've got a certificate for health and safety. And then you're walking down the road carelessly and it's, it's nobody's fault, but then it's your fault, you've caused an accident. And the health and safety thing is, is like, it was for nothing. So we need to be careful as to how we go about in life so as not to cause a lot of mayhem and confusion. <laughs> That's, that's a really important distinction, again, it's, the, it's the, that distinction that's here between um, one of the distinctions between the fool that we saw earlier on, you know, is full of their own opinions, they always have an answer, all of that, and the wise person is that thing of taking time and pausing and reflecting and, and thinking. Um, some of you will know that I'm a tutor on an MA course, and one of, the, one of the main skills that we're teaching for leaders is being a reflective practitioner, that you step back all the time from what you're doing, and you're reflecting on it and asking questions and allowing God's word and God to speak into that. I now saw a hand, I've forgotten whose it was. I was just gonna say it's important that we think about our bosses, our leaders, our, um, you know, our government, that they may not have got into the positions that they're in from being the wisest of people. They may have got into their positions from being the loudest of people. So therefore we have to pray about the decisions that they make and you know look to God to know whether we should be voting this way or we should be going with the manager's decision because it might not always be the right one they may be the fool rather than the wise person as someone who's an active member of a political party and is often has been in meetings where decisions are made on candidates um, I have to say that sadly sometimes what you say is true it is about sometimes the person with the loudest rather than the person that is the wisest. Okay, let's take the next section. So uh, chapter 10, verse 12. Wise words, sorry, words from a wise man's mouth are gracious. But a fool is consumed by his own lips. At the beginning, his words are folly. At the end, they are wicked madness. And the fool multiplies words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell him what will happen after him? A fool's work wearies him. He does not know the way to town. Now, a, a person's conversation, speech, exposes their heart. The point here is that a wise person's speech leads to harmony. It's helpful. It's appropriate. In contrast, the fool, remembering what that term means here, and their torrent of speech destroys their own reputation. Now, that phrase, don't know the way to town, I know in some cultures that's still used. I was, I've been trying to remember where I was. I was somewhere overseas, and it, that was actually used to me as describe somebody else, you know, ugh, they don't even know the way to town. But it doesn't quite work in Greenford. So I came across a paraphrase of it, they could get lost on an escalator. <laughs> that, I thought, worked, worked well. People who speak much, with a lot of conviction, even claiming to know what's coming, but as we've seen, it's not possible to know. They start in folly, but their outcome, the final outcome is moral and spiritual downfall. 
Let's come to the last uh, block of verses that we're going to look at this morning. And then we'll come to the last question. Uh, Verse 16, woe to you, O land, whose king was a servant, whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at a proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. What this image is about is that the influence, to quote Derek Kidner, the influence that seeps down from the top sets the tone for the whole community. And we know that's true in government, it's true in an organization. The influence that seeps down from the top sets the tone for the whole community. The word servant in verse 16 really means someone who is inexperienced. So so the, the contrast that's being made here is contrasting leadership that's mature and self-controlled with leadership that is immature and self-indulgent, feasting in the morning. Last three verses, 18 to 20. If a man is lazy, the rafters sag. If his hands are idle, the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry, but money is the answer for everything. We'll come back to that in a moment. Do not revile the king even in your thoughts. See if you can spot the proverb that we have from this today. Do not revile the king even in your thoughts, or curse the rich in your bedroom, because a bird of the air may carry your words, and a bird on the wing may report what you say. Yeah, we have that phrase. Oh, a little bird told me. That's where it comes from. What these verses are about, verse 18 is a reminder that it takes nothing more than laziness to bring something down. The metaphor here is a house, the person's not repairing it, the rafters are sagging because they're getting wet, because the house is leaking, and so on and so on. Verse 19 is the... uh, Uh, fool's viewpoint in this context. And verse 20, as I said, is perhaps the origin of that phrase, a little bird told me. So final question, we've got just two or three minutes for this. Coming out of these last couple of sections, what are some of the lessons that we might take that we apply into our world today? I've never had the courage to do it, but I always think it's a good idea when you're going for an interview for a job to ask whether the person you're working for is good at their job. Very interesting. (laughs) Very interesting, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Any other thoughts and reflections about how these verses might apply into our own life? I see some hands there. At... It was you, was it? I saw a hand. I didn't see who I don't sound mean, and, but um, and not because I work hard. But the whole benefit system thing can, I suppose, create laziness. Because um, when it talk, talks about laziness, for example... You could go out and find work. It may not be work that you really want, but it could be work still that could get you somewhere. So you get into, because you're looking for that ultimate job, you stay unemployed, and you get handouts rather than trying to to make something that could lead you somewhere. So I think it just evokes laziness sometimes. Thank you. I think it's uh, a very strong reminder to just 
wait before you react. It's, it's one of the hardest things for us to do as a Christian is be still and know that he is God. Mm-hmm. So finding the time and space when you're being, people around you are demanding a reaction immediately to actually go and find that moment to be still and know that God is there and with you. It's a way of life that's worth trying to work out how to do because that will all make life easier. Great, thank you very much. That link back in to be still as well is so important. Final two. It says in what you said, if a man is lazy, the rafters sag. If his hands are idle, the house leaks. Well, my roof is leaking, but I'm not lazy. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I don't think that undermines the general principle of the proverb. Uh, it's the, the, the last bit. Um, don't make fun of the powerful even in your own bedroom for a little bird might deliver your message and tell them what you said. I mean, that really is about social media as far as I'm concerned um, because it's so easy. Everyone's a critic on social media. And what I find ironic is that obviously the symbol for Twitter is a little bird. Yeah, yeah I hadn't made that connection. Fantastic. Very last one. Yeah, I think it's true that... Um, the benefit system before could have made people lazy because records show that people have found jobs. But since we've been working doing this I hope thing, there's lots of people that we've come across in high positions with a big salary that are lazy. (laughs) And if you want to use that way of the house is leaking, you could see why there's so much problem is in the youth because they're lazy. So what they're looking after is ruined. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Two things I want to sum up. I'm going to pray for us in a moment as we, uh, as we finish. Um, two, I think, key things to take away from this passage this morning. Uh, the first thing is that because a person is loud and full of words does not mean that they're full of wisdom. You take hold of that. And the second principle that underlies a lot of this stuff is that wise people... Is people whose hearts are after God pause to consider and prepare before either speaking or doing. Let's stand together. Let me pray for you as we uh, come to an end of our meeting this morning. If you're able to stand, please do so. If you're not, then do remain seated. I'm going to give you uh, a few moments of silence for you to make your own response to God, and then I'm going to pray for us together. Father God, as uh, we go back tomorrow into our everyday workday lives, whether it's back into our work context, back into our family responsibilities, into whatever situation we're working with and facing, Father, I ask that you'll help us to be people of wisdom. where we can take time to think, to pause, to reflect, to be still and to know that you are God before we speak, before we tweet, write, text or do. We can be people who, whatever our context and situation, can be a real powerful, positive influence for wisdom and graciousness and goodness. In Jesus' name. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv. (laughs) 